The Shadow Over Innsmouth by H.P. Lovecraft Read by Richard Coyle During the winter of 1927 to 28, officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in the ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of it in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten, and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the major clashes in a spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious number of arrests, the abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials, or even definite charges, were reported. Nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular jails of the nation. There were vague statements about disease and concentration camps, and later about dispersal in various naval and military prisons. But nothing positive ever developed. Innsmouth itself was left almost depopulated, and is even now only beginning to show signs of a sluggishly revived existence. Complaints from many liberal organizations were met with long, confidential discussions, and representatives were taken on trips to certain camps and prisons. As a result, these societies became surprisingly passive and reticent. Newspaper men were harder to manage, but seemed largely to cooperate with the government in the end. Only one paper, a tabloid always discounted because of its wild policy, mentioned the deep-diving submarine that discharged torpedoes downward in the marine abyss just beyond Devil Reef. That item, gathered by chance in a haunt of sailors, seemed indeed rather far-fetched since the low black reef lies a full mile and a half out from Innsmouth Harbour. People around the country and in the nearby towns muttered a great deal among themselves, but said very little to the outer world. They had talked about dying and half-deserted Innsmouth for nearly a century, and nothing new could be wilder or more hideous than what they had whispered and hinted years before. Many things had taught them secretiveness, and there was now no need to exert pressure on them. Besides, they really knew very little, for wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, keep neighbors off from Innsmouth on the landward side. But at last I am going to defy the ban on speech about this thing, for my contact with this affair has been closer than that of any other layman, and I have carried away impressions which are yet to drive me to drastic measures. It was I who fled frantically out of Innsmouth in the early morning hours of July 16th, 1927, and whose frightened appeals for government inquiry and action brought on the whole reported episode. I was willing enough to stay mute while the affair was fresh and uncertain, but now that it's an old story, with public interest and curiosity gone, I have an odd craving to whisper about those few frightful hours in that ill-rumoured and evilly shadowed seaport of death and blasphemous abnormality. The mere telling helps me to restore confidence in my own faculties, to reassure myself that I was not simply the first to succumb to a contagious nightmare hallucination. It helps me, too, in making up my mind regarding a certain terrible step which lies ahead of me. I never heard of Innsmouth till the day before I saw it for the first and, so far, last time. 
I was celebrating my coming of age by a tour of New England, sightseeing, antiquarian and genealogical, and had planned to go directly from ancient Newburyport to Arkham, whence my mother's family was derived. I had no car, but was traveling by train, trolley and motor coach, always seeking the cheapest possible route. In Newburyport, they told me that the steam train was the thing to take to Arkham, and it was only at the station ticket office, when I demurred at the high fare, that I learned about Innsmouth. The stout, shrewd-faced agent whose speech showed him to be no local man seemed sympathetic toward my efforts at economy, and made a suggestion that none of my other informants had offered. You could take that old bus, I suppose he said with a certain hesitation. But it ain't thought much of hereabouts. Goes to Innsmouth. You may have heard about that, so the people don't like it. Run by an Innsmouth fella, Joe Sargent. But never gets any custom from here, or Arkham either, I guess. I wonder it keeps running at all. I suppose it's cheap enough, but I never see more than two or three people in it. Nobody but those Innsmouth folks. Leaves the square, in front of Hammond's drugstore, 10 a.m., 7 p.m., unless they change lately. Looks like a terrible rattle trap. I've never been on it. That was the first I ever heard of Shadowed Innsmouth. Any reference to a town not shown on common maps or listed in recent guidebooks would have interested me, and the agent's odd manner of illusion roused something like real curiosity. A town able to inspire such dislike in its neighbors, I thought, must be at least rather unusual and worthy of a tourist's attention. If it came before Arkham, I would stop off there. And so I asked the agent to tell me something about it. He was very deliberate and spoke with an air of feeling slightly superior to what he said. Innsmouth? Well, it's a queer kind of a town down at the mouth of the Minuxet. Used to be almost a city, quite a port before the War of 1812, but all gone to pieces in the last hundred years or so. No railroad now, B&M never went through, and the branch line from Rowley was given up years ago. More empty houses than there are people, I guess. No business to speak of except fishing and lobstering. Everybody trades mostly here in Arkham or Ipswich. Once they had quite a few mills, but nothing's left now except one gold refinery running on the leanest kind of part-time. That refinery, though, used to be a big thing. An old man Marsh who owns it must be Richard and Croesus. Queer old duck, though, and sticks mighty close in his home. He's supposed to have developed some skin disease or deformity late in life that makes him keep out of sight. Grandson of Captain Obed Marsh who founded the business. His mother seems to have been some kind of foreigner. They say a South Sea Islander. So everybody raised Cain when he married an Ipswich girl 50 years ago. And why is everybody so down on Anne's mouth? Well, young fellow, you mustn't take too much stock in what people around here say. You ought to hear, though, what some of the old-timers tell about the Black Reef off the coast. Devil Reef, they call it. It's well above water a good part of the time, and never much below it, but at that you could hardly call it an island. The story is that there's a whole legion of devils seen sometimes on that reef, sprawled about or darting in and out of some kind of caves near the top. One of the things they had against old Captain Marsh was that he was supposed to land on it sometimes at night when the tide was right. Maybe he did. For I dare say the rock formation was interesting, and it's just barely possible he was looking for pirate loot and maybe finding it. But there was talk of his dealing with demons there. That was before the big epidemic of 1846, when over half the folks in Innsmouth was carried off. They never did quite figure out what the trouble was, but it was probably some foreign kind of disease brought from China or somewhere by the shipping. Surely was bad enough. They can't be more than 300 or 400 people living there now. But the real thing behind the way folks feel is simply race prejudice. And I don't say I'm blaming those that hold it. Now, I hate those Innsmouth folks myself. There certainly is a strange kind of streak in them. I don't know how to explain it. 
but it sort of makes you crawl. You notice a little in Sergeant if you take his bus. Some of them have queer, narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy, starey eyes that never seem to shut. And their skin ain't quite right, rough and scabby, and the sides of their necks are all shriveled or creased up. They get bald, too, very young. The older fellows look the worst. Fact is, I don't believe I've ever seen a very old chap of that kind. Anyways, if you will go there, there's a hotel in Innsmouth. It's called the Gilman House, but I don't believe it can amount to much. I wouldn't advise you to try it. Better stay over here and take the 10 o'clock bus tomorrow morning. Then you can get an evening bus there for Arkham at 8 o'clock. There was a, a factory inspector who stopped at the Gilman a couple years ago, and he had a lot of unpleasant hints about the place. Seems they got a queer crowd there. But this fella heard voices in other rooms, though most of them was empty. It gave him the shivers. It was foreign talk, he thought. But he said the bad thing about it was the kind of voice that sometimes spoke. It sounded so unnatural, slopping-like, he said, that he didn't dare undress and go to sleep. Just waited up and lit out the first thing in the morning. The talk went on most all night. This fella, Casey his name was, had a lot to say about how the Innsmouth folks watched him and seemed kind of on guard. You know, it's always been a kind of mystery where the marshes get the gold they were fine. They've never seemed to do much buying in that line. But years ago, they shipped out an enormous lot of ingots. Used to be talk of a queer, foreign kind of jewelry that the sailors and refinery men sometimes sold on the sly or that was seen once or twice on some of the Marsh women folks. People thought that maybe old Captain Obed traded for it in some heathen port. Others thought, and still think, he'd found an old pirate cache out on Devil Reef. After my strange conversation with the agent, I decided to spend part of that evening at the Newburyport Public Library, looking up data about Innsmouth. Most interesting of all was a glancing reference to that strange jewelry vaguely associated with the town. It had evidently impressed the whole countryside more than a little, for mention was made of specimens in the Museum of Miskatonic University at Arkham, and in the display room of the Newburyport Historical Society. Despite the relative lateness of the hour, I resolved to see the local sample, said to be a large, queerly proportioned thing evidently meant for a tiara, if it could possibly be arranged. The librarian gave me a note of introduction to the curator of the society, a Miss Anna Tilton, who lived nearby, and after a brief explanation, that ancient gentlewoman was kind enough to pilot me into the closed building since the hour was not outrageously late. It took no excessive sensitiveness to beauty to make me literally gasp at the strange, unearthly splendor of the alien, opulent fantasy that rested there on a purple velvet cushion. Even now I can hardly describe what I saw, though it was clearly enough a sort of tiara as the description had said. It was tall in front, and with a very large and curiously irregular periphery, as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outline. The material seemed to be predominantly gold, though a weird lighter lustrousness hinted at some strange alloy with an equally beautiful and scarcely identifiable metal. Its condition was almost perfect. The longer I looked, the more the thing fascinated me. And in this fascination, there was a curiously disturbing element hardly to be classified or accounted for. At first, I decided that it was the queer, otherworldly quality of the art which made me uneasy. All other art objects I had ever seen either belonged to some known racial or national stream, 
or else were consciously modernistic defiances of every recognized stream. This tiara was neither. It clearly belonged to some settled technique of infinite maturity and perfection. Yet that technique was utterly remote from any, Eastern or Western, ancient or modern, which I had ever heard of or seen exemplified. It was as if the workmanship were that of another planet. However, I soon saw that my uneasiness had a second and perhaps equally potent source residing in the pictorial and mathematical suggestions of the strange designs. The patterns all hinted of remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ichthyic and half Batrachian in suggestion, which one could not dissociate from a certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory, as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive functions are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times, I fancy that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs was overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. In odd contrast to the tiara's aspect was its brief and prosy history as related by Miss Tilton. It had been pawned for a ridiculous sum at a shop in State Street in 1873 by a drunken Innsmouth man shortly afterward killed in a brawl. The society had acquired it directly from the pawnbroker, at once giving it a display worthy of its quality. It was labelled as of probable East Indian or Indo-Chinese provenance, though the attribution was frankly tentative. Miss Tilton, comparing all possible hypotheses regarding its origin and its presence in New England, was inclined to believe that it formed part of some exotic pirate hoard discovered by old Captain Obed Marsh. As the good lady showed me out of the building, she made it clear that the pirate theory of the Marsh fortune was a popular one among the intelligent people of the region. Her own attitude toward shadowed Innsmouth, which she had never seen, was one of disgust at a community slipping far down the cultural scale and she assured me that the rumors of devil worship were partly justified by a peculiar secret cult which had gained force there and engulfed all the Orthodox churches. It was called, she said, the Esoteric Order of Dagon, and was undoubtedly a debased, quasi-pagan thing imported from the East a century before at a time when the Innsmouth fisheries seemed to be going barren. Its persistence among a simple people was quite natural in view of the sudden and permanent return of abundantly fine fishing, and it soon came to be the greatest influence on the town, replacing Freemasonry altogether and taking up headquarters in the old Masonic Hall on Newchurch Green. All this to the pious Miss Tilton, formed an excellent reason for shunning the ancient town of decay and desolation. But to me, it was merely a fresh incentive. To my architectural and historical anticipations was now added an acute anthropological zeal, and I could scarcely sleep in my small room at the Y as the night wore away. Shortly before ten the next morning, I stood with one small valise in front of Hammond's Drug Store in Old Market Square, waiting for the Innsmouth bus. As the hour for its arrival drew near, I noticed a general drift of the loungers to other places up the street, or to the ideal lunch across the square. Evidently, the ticket agent had not exaggerated the dislike which local people bore toward Innsmouth and its denizens. In a few moments, a small motor coach of extreme decrepitude and dirty grey colour rattled down State Street, made a turn, 
and drew up at the curb beside me. I felt immediately that it was the right one, a guess which the half-illegible sign on the windshield, Arkham, Innsmouth, Newburyport, soon verified. There were only three passengers, dark, unkempt men of sullen visage and somewhat youthful cast, and when the vehicle stopped, they clumsily shambled out and began walking up State Street in a silent, almost furtive fashion. The driver also alighted, and I watched him as he went into the drugstore to make some purchase. This, I reflected, must be the Joe Sergeant mentioned by the ticket agent. And even before I noticed any details, there spread over me a wave of spontaneous aversion which could be neither checked nor explained. It suddenly struck me as very natural that the local people should not wish to ride on a bus owned and driven by this man, or to visit any oftener than possible the habitat of such a man and his kinsfolk. When the driver came out of the store, I looked at him more carefully and tried to determine the source of my evil impression. He was a thin, stoop-shouldered man, not much under six feet tall, dressed in shabby blue civilian clothes and wearing a frayed grey golf cap. His age was perhaps thirty-five, but the odd, deep creases in the sides of his neck made him seem older when one did not study his dull, expressionless face. He had a narrow head, bulging, watery blue eyes that seemed never to wink, a flat nose, receding forehead and chin, and singularly undeveloped ears. His long, thick lip and coarse-poured, greyish cheeks seemed almost beardless, except for some sparse yellow hairs that straggled and curled in irregular patches. And in places, the surface seemed queerly irregular, as if peeling from some cutaneous disease. His hands were large and heavily veined, and had a very unusual greyish-blue tinge. The fingers were strikingly short in proportion to the rest of the structure and seemed to have a tendency to curl closely into the huge palm. As he walked toward the bus, I observed his peculiarly shambling gait and saw that his feet were inordinately immense. The more I studied them, the more I wondered how he could buy any shoes to fit them. A certain greasiness about the fellow increased my dislike. He was evidently given to working or lounging around the fish docks and carried with him much of their characteristic smell. Just what foreign blood was in him I could not even guess. His oddities certainly did not look Asiatic, Polynesian, Levantine or Negroid. Yet I could see why the people found him alien. I myself would have thought of biological degeneration rather than alienage. I was sorry when I saw that there would be no other passengers on the bus. Somehow I did not like the idea of riding alone with this driver. But as leaving time obviously approached, I conquered my qualms and followed the man aboard, extending him a dollar bill and murmuring the single word, Innsmouth. He looked curiously at me for a second, as he returned forty cents change without speaking. I took a seat far behind him, but on the same side of the bus, since I wished to watch the shore during the journey. At length, the decrepit vehicle started with a jerk, and rattled noisily past the old brick buildings of State Street amidst a cloud of vapour from the exhaust. Glancing at the people on the sidewalks, I thought I detected in them a curious wish to avoid looking at the bus, or at least a wish to avoid seeming to look at it. Then we turned to the left into High Street, where the going was smoother, flying by stately old mansions of the early Republic and still older colonial farmhouses, passing the Lower Green and Parker River, and finally emerging into a long, monotonous stretch of open shore country. The day was warm and sunny, but the landscape of sand, sedge-grass and stunted shrubbery became more and more desolate as we proceeded. Out the window I could see the blue water and the sandy line of Plum Island, 
and we presently drew very near the beach as our narrow road veered off from the main highway to Rowley and Ipswich. There were no visible houses, and I could tell by the state of the road that traffic was very light hereabouts. The small, weather-worn telephone poles carried only two wires. Now and then we crossed crude wooden bridges over tidal creeks that wound far inland and promoted the general isolation of the region. At last we lost sight of Plum Island and saw the vast expanse of the open Atlantic on our left. Our narrow course began to climb steeply and I felt a singular sense of disquiet in looking at the lonely crest ahead where the rotted roadway met the sky. It was as if the boss were about to keep on in its ascent, leaving the sane earth altogether and merging with the unknown arcana of upper air and cryptical sky. The smell of the sea took on ominous implications, and the silent driver's bent, rigid back and narrow head became more and more hateful. As I looked at him, I saw that the back of his head was almost as hairless as his face, having only a few straggling yellow strands upon a grey, scabrous surface. Then we reached the crest and beheld the outspread valley beyond, where the Minuxit joins the sea just north of the long line of cliffs that culminate in Kingsport Head and veer off toward Cape Ann. On the far, misty horizon I could just make out the dizzy profile of the head, topped by the queer, ancient house of which so many legends are told. But for the moment, all my attention was captured by the nearer panorama just below me. I had, I realized, come face to face with rumor shadowed Innsmouth. Innsmouth was a town of wide extent and dense construction, yet one with a portentous dearth of visible life. From the tangle of chimney pots, scarcely a wisp of smoke came, and the three tall steeples loomed stark and unpainted against the seaward horizon. Here and there, the ruins of wharves jutted out from the shore to end in indeterminate rottenness, those farthest south seeming the most decayed. And far out at sea, despite a high tide, I glimpsed a long black line scarcely rising above the water, yet carrying a suggestion of odd, latent malignancy. This, I knew, must be Devil Reef. As I looked, a subtle, curious sense of beckoning seemed superadded to the grim repulsion. And oddly enough, I found this overtone more disturbing than the primary impression. Soon, cross streets and junctions began to appear, those on the left leading to shoreward realms of unpaved squalor and decay, while those on the right shewed vistas of departed grandeur. So far I had seen no people in the town, but there now came signs of a sparse habitation, curtained windows here and there, and an occasional battered motor car at the curb. But I was not to reach my destination without one very strong impression of poignantly disagreeable quality. The bus had come to a sort of open concourse or radial point, with churches on two sides and the bedraggled remains of a circular green in the centre. And I was looking at a large, a pillared hall on the right-hand junction ahead. The structure's once white paint was now grey and peeling, and the black and gold sign on the pediment was so faded that I could only with difficulty make out the words Esoteric Order of Dagon. This, then, was the former Masonic Hall now given over to a degraded cult. As I strained to decipher this inscription, my notice was distracted by the raucous tones of a cracked bell across the street, and I quickly turned to look out the window on my side of the coach. Though the hands of its clock were missing on the side I glimpsed, I knew that those hoarse strokes were telling the hour of eleven.
Then, suddenly, all thoughts of time were blotted out by an onrushing image of sharp intensity and unaccountable horror which had seized me before I knew what it really was. The door of the church basement was open, revealing a rectangle of blackness inside. And as I looked, a certain object crossed, or seemed to cross that dark rectangle, burning into my brain a momentary conception of nightmare, which was all the more maddening because analysis could not shew a single nightmarish quality in it. It was a living object, the first except the driver that I had seen since entering the compact part of the town. And had I been in a steadier mood, I would have found nothing whatever of terror in it. Clearly, as I realized a moment later, it was the pastor, clad in some peculiar vestments doubtless introduced since the Order of Dagon had modified the ritual of the local churches. The thing which had probably caught my first subconscious glance and supplied the touch of bizarre horror was the tall tiara he wore, an almost exact duplicate of the one Miss Tilton had shown me the previous evening. Was it not natural that a local mystery cult should adopt among its regimentals a unique type of headdress made familiar to the community in some strange way, perhaps as treasure trove? A sound of waterfalls became more and more distinct, and presently I saw a fairly deep river gorge ahead, spanned by a wide, iron-railed highway bridge beyond which a large square opened out. As we clanked over the bridge, I looked out on both sides and observed some factory buildings on the edge of the grassy bluff or partway down. Then we rolled into the large semicircular square across the river and drew up on the right-hand side in front of a tall, cupola-crowned building with remnants of yellow paint and with a half-effaced sign proclaiming it to be the Gilman House. I was glad to get out of that bus and at once proceeded to check my valise in the shabby hotel lobby. There was only one person in sight, an elderly man without what I had come to call the inn's mouth look, and I decided not to ask him any of the questions which bothered me, remembering that odd things had been noticed in this hotel. Instead, I strolled out on the square, from which the bus had already gone, and studied the scene minutely and appraisingly. For some reason or other, I chose to make my first inquiries at the chain grocery, whose personnel was not likely to be native to Innsmouth. I found a solitary boy of about 17 in charge, and was pleased to note the brightness and affability which promised cheerful information. He seemed exceptionally eager to talk, and I soon gathered that he did not like the place, its fishy smell, or its furtive people. There was, he said, no public library or chamber of commerce in Innsmouth, but I could probably find my way about. Certain spots were almost forbidden territory, as he had learned at considerable cost. One must not, for example, linger much around the marsh refinery, or around any of the still-used churches, or around the pillared order of Dagon Hall at New Church Green. Those churches were very odd, all violently disavowed by their respective denominations elsewhere, and apparently using the queerest kind of ceremonials and clerical vestments. As for the Innsmouth people, the youth hardly knew what to make of them. They were as furtive and seldom seen as animals that live in burrows, and one could hardly imagine how they passed the time apart from their desultory fishing. Perhaps Judging from the quantities of bootleg liquor they consumed, they lay for most of the daylight hours in an alcoholic stupor. They seemed sullenly banded together in some sort of fellowship and understanding, despising the world as if they had access to other and preferable spheres of entity. Their appearance, especially those staring, unwinking eyes which one never saw shut, was certainly shocking enough and their voices were disgusting. It was awful to hear them chanting in their churches at night, and especially during their main festivals or revivals, which fell twice a year on April 30th and October 31st. They were very fond of the water, 
and swam a great deal in both river and harbour. Swimming races out to Devil Reef were very common, and everyone in sight seemed well able to share in this arduous sport. When one came to think of it, it was generally only rather young people who were seen about in public, and of these, the oldest were apt to be the most tainted-looking. When exceptions did occur, they were mostly persons with no trace of aberrancy, like the old clerk at the hotel. One wondered what became of the bulk of the older folk, and whether the inn's mouth look were not a strange and insidious disease phenomenon which increased its hold as years advanced. Only a very rare affliction, of course, could bring about such vast and radical anatomical changes in a single individual after maturity. Changes involving osseous factors as basic as the shape of the skull. But then even this aspect was no more baffling and unheard of than the visible features of the malady as a whole. It would be hard, the youth implied, to form any real conclusions regarding such a matter, since one never came to know the natives personally, no matter how long one might live in Innsmouth. The youth was certain that many specimens, even worse than the worst visible ones, were kept locked indoors in some places. People sometimes heard the queerest kind of sounds. The tottering waterfront hovels north of the river were reputedly connected by hidden tunnels, being thus a veritable warren of unseen abnormalities. What kind of foreign blood, if any, these beings had? It was impossible to tell. They sometimes kept certain especially repulsive characters out of sight when government agents and others from the outside world came to town. It would be of no use, my informant said, to ask the natives anything about the place. The only one who would talk was a very aged but normal-looking man who lived at the poor house on the north rim of the town and spent his time walking about or lounging around the fire station. This hoary character, Zadok Allen, was 96 years old and somewhat touched in the head, besides being the town drunkard. He was a strange, furtive creature who constantly looked over his shoulder as if afraid of something, and when sober, could not be persuaded to talk at all with strangers. He was, however, unable to resist any offer of his favorite poison, and once drunk, would furnish the most astonishing fragments of whispered reminiscence. It was probably from him that some of the wildest popular whispers and delusions were derived. Several non-native residents had reported monstrous glimpses from time to time. But between old Zadok's tales and the malformed denizens, it was no wonder such illusions were current. None of the non-natives ever stayed out late at night, there being a widespread impression that it was not wise to do so. Besides, the streets were loathsomely dark. As for business, the abundance of fish was certainly almost uncanny, but the natives were taking less and less advantage of it. Of course, the town's real business was the refinery, whose commercial office was on the square, only a few doors east of where we stood. Old Man Marsh was never seen, but sometimes went to the works in a closed, curtained car. His sons had formerly conducted the office in the square, but latterly they had been keeping out of sight a good deal and leaving the brunt of affairs to the younger generation. The sons and their sisters had come to look very queer, especially the elder ones, and it was said that their health was failing. One of the Marsh daughters was a repellent, reptilian-looking woman who wore an excess of weird jewellery, clearly of the same exotic tradition as that to which the strange tiara belonged. My informant had noticed it many times, and had heard it spoken of as coming from some secret horde, either of pirates or of demons. The Marshes, together with the other three gently-bred families of the town, the Waits, the Gilmans, and the Elliots 
were all very retiring. They lived in immense houses along Washington Street, and several were reputed to harbor in concealment certain living kinsfolk whose personal aspect forbade public view, and whose deaths had been reported and recorded. Warning me that many of the street signs were down, the youth drew for my benefit a rough but ample and painstaking sketch map of the town's salient features. Disliking the dinginess of the single restaurant I had seen, I bought a fair supply of cheese crackers and ginger wafers to serve as a launch later on. My program, I decided, would be to thread the principal streets, talk with any non-natives I might encounter, and catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham. The town, I could see, formed a significant and exaggerated example of communal decay. But being no sociologist, I would limit my serious observations to the field of architecture. Thus, I began my systematic, though half-bewildered, tour of Innsmouth's narrow, shadow-blighted ways. Not a living thing did I see, except for the scattered fishermen on the distant breakwater. And not a sound did I hear, save the lapping of the harbour tides and the roar of the falls in the Minoxid. The town was getting more and more on my nerves, and I looked behind me furtively as I picked my way back over the tottering Water Street Bridge. The Fish Street Bridge, according to the sketch, was in ruins. North of the river there were traces of squalid life, active fish-packing houses in Water Street, smoking chimneys and patched roofs here and there, occasional sounds from indeterminate sources, and infrequent, shambling forms in the dismal streets and unpaved lanes. But I seemed to find this even more oppressive than the southerly desertion. For one thing, the people were more hideous and abnormal than those near the center of the town, so that I was several times evilly reminded of something utterly fantastic which I could not quite place. Undoubtedly, the alien strain in the Innsmouth folk was stronger here than farther inland. Unless, indeed, the Innsmouth look were a disease rather than a blood strain. In which case, this district might be held to harbor the more advanced cases. One detail that annoyed me was the distribution of the few faint sounds I heard. They ought naturally to have come wholly from the visibly inhabited houses, yet in reality, were often strongest inside the most rigidly boarded up facades. There were creakings, scurryings, and hoarse, doubtful noises, and I thought uncomfortably about the hidden tunnels suggested by the grocery boy. Suddenly I found myself wondering what the voices of those denizens would be like. I had heard no speech so far in this quarter, and was unaccountably anxious not to do so. Pausing only long enough to look at two fine but ruinous old churches at Main and Church Streets, I hastened out of that vile waterfront slum. My next logical goal was New Church Green, but somehow or other I could not bear to repass the church in whose basement I had glimpsed the inexplicably frightening form of that strangely diademed priest or pastor. Besides, the grocery youth had told me that the churches, as well as the Order of Dagon Hall, were not advisable neighborhoods for strangers. Accordingly, I kept north along Main to Martin, then turning inland, crossing Federal Street safely north of the Green, and entering the decayed patrician neighborhood of Northern Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams Streets. Though these stately old avenues were ill-surfaced and unkempt, their elm-shaded dignity had not entirely departed. Mansion after mansion claimed my gaze, most of them decrepit and boarded up amidst neglected grounds, but one or two in each street showing signs of occupancy. In Washington Street, there was a row of four or five in excellent repair and with finely tended lawns and gardens, the most sumptuous of these with wide terraced parterres extending back the whole way to Lafayette Street. I took to be the home of Old Man Marsh, 
the afflicted refinery owner. In all these streets, no living thing was visible, and I wondered at the complete absence of cats and dogs from Innsmouth. Another thing which puzzled and disturbed me, even in some of the best preserved mansions, was the tightly shuttered condition of many third story and attic windows. Furtiveness and secretiveness seemed universal in this hushed city of alienage and death. And I could not escape the sensation of being watched from ambush on every hand by sly, staring eyes that never shut. I shivered as the cracked stroke of three sounded from a belfry on my left. Too well did I recall the squat church from which those notes came. Following Washington Street toward the river, I now faced a new zone of former industry and commerce. Noting the ruins of a factory ahead and seeing others with the traces of an old railway station and covered railway bridge beyond, up the gorge on my right. The uncertain bridge, now before me, was posted with a warning sign, but I took the risk and crossed again to the south bank where traces of life reappeared. Furtive, shambling creatures stared cryptically in my direction, and more normal faces eyed me coldly and curiously. Innsmouth was rapidly becoming intolerable, and I turned down Payne Street toward the square in the hope of getting some vehicle to take me to Arkham before the still distant starting time of that sinister boss. It was then that I saw the tumble-down fire station on my left and noticed the red-faced, bushy-bearded, watery-eyed old man in nondescript rags who sat on a bench in front of it, talking with a pair of unkempt, but not abnormal-looking firemen. This, of course, must be Zadok Allen, the half-crazed, licorice nonagenarian whose tales of old Innsmouth and its shadow were so hideous and incredible. It must have been some imp of the perverse, or some sardonic pull from dark, hidden sources which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone, and I was even then hurrying toward the square in an effort to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed and incredible legends, and I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking to him. Yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay, with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories, was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth, and old Zadok must have seen everything which went on around Innsmouth for the last ninety years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and caution, and in my youthful egotism, I fancied I might be able to sift the nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant outpouring I would probably extract with the aid of raw whiskey. I knew that I could not accost him then and there, for the firemen would surely notice and object. Instead, I reflected, I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy had told me it was plentiful. Then, I would loaf near the fire station in apparent casualness and fall in with old Zadok after he'd started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth said that he was very restless, seldom sitting around the station for more than an hour or two at a time. A quart bottle of whiskey was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store just off the square in Elliott Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of the staring, Innsmouth look, but was quite civil in his way, being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers and the like, as were occasionally in town. 
Re-entering the square, I saw that Locke was with me. For, shuffling out of Paint Street around the corner of the Gilman House, I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zarak Allen himself. In accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle, and soon realized that he'd begun to shuffle wistfully after me as I turned into Waite Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery boy had prepared, and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The only people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater, and by going a few squares south, I could get beyond the range of these, finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf, and being free to question old Zadok unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street, I could hear a faint and wheezy, Hey, mister! behind me, and I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the court bottle. I began putting out feelers as we walked along to Water Street and turned southward amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length, I saw a grass-grown opening toward the sea between crumbling brick walls, with the weedy length of an earth and masonry wharf projecting beyond. Piles of moss-covered stones near the water promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for a long secret colloquy. So, I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in amongst the mossy stones. The air of death and desertion was ghoulish, and the smell of fish almost insufferable but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham, and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tippler, meanwhile eating my own frugal lunch. In my donations, I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's vinous garrulousness to pass into a stupor. After an hour, his furtive taciturnity showed signs of disappearing, but much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing our wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophize in a sententious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour, I feared my quarter whiskey would not be enough to produce results and was wondering whether I'd better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, chance made the opening which my questions had been unable to make, and the wheezing ancient's rambling took a turn that caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. My back was toward the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it, and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light on the low, distant line of Devil Reef then showing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waves. The sight seemed to displease him, for he began a series of weak curses which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent toward me, took hold of my cold lapel, and hissed out some hints that could not be mistaken. That cursed place of all wickedness, where the deep water starts, gate of hell, sheer drop down to a bottom no sound and line can touch. Old Captain Nobad done it, him that found out more and was good for him in the South Sea Islands. Everybody was in a bad way them days, trade falling off, mills losing business, even the new ones. And the best of our men folks killed the privateering in the War of 1812, or lust with the El Isebrig and the Ranger Snow, both of them Gilman Ventures. Obed Marsh, he had three ships afloat, Brigantine Columbia, Brig Hetty, and Bark Sumatra Queen. 
he was the only one as kept on with the East Indian Pacific trade, though Estrus Martin's barkentine Malay pride made a venture as late as twenty-eight. Never was nobody like Captain Obed. Oh, limb of Satan. <laughs> I can mind him a-telling about fern parts, calling all the folks stupid for going to Christian meeting and bearing their burdens meek and lowly. Says they ought to get better gods like some of the folks in the Indies. Gods ads that bring them good fishing in return for their sacrifices and that really answer folks' prayers. Matt Elliot, his first mate, talked a lot too. Only he was again folks doing any heathen things. Told about an island east of Otaheite, where there was a lot of stone ruins older than anybody knew anything about, kind of like them on Ponape in the Carolines, but with carvings of faces that looked like the big statues on the Easter Island. They was a little volcanic island near there too. Where there was other ruins with different carvings, ruins all wore away like they'd been under the sea unked, and with pictures of awful monsters all over him. Well, sir, mad, he says the natives around there had all the fish they could catch and sported bracelets and armlets and head rigs made out of a queer kind of gold and covered with pictures of monsters just like the ones carved over the ruins on the little island. Sort of fish-like frogs or frog-like fishes that was drawn in all kinds of positions like they was human beings. Oh, Betty notices besides that lots of the handsome young folks had drop out of sight for good from year to year and that there weren't many old folks around. Also, he thinks some of the folks looked darn queer, even for Kanakis. It took... Oh, bet to get the truth out of them heathen. I don't know how he done it, but he begun by trading for the gold-like things they wore. Asked them where they'd come from, and if they could get more, and finally wormed the story out of the old chief. Well, Wallachia, they called him. Nobody but Obed had ever believed the old yeller devil, but the captain could read folks like they was books. <laughs> Nobody never believes me now when I tell him, and I don't suppose you will, young feller. Though come to look at you, you have kind of got them sharp reading eyes like Obed had. I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. Well, sir, Obed, he learned that these things on this earth, as most folks never heard about, and wouldn't believe if they did hear. It seems these Kanakis was sacrificing heaps of their young men and maidens to some kind of god things that lived under the sea and getting all kinds of favor in return. They met the things on the little islet with the queer ruins, and it seems made sign talk as soon as they got over being scared and pieced up a bargain before long. When it come to mating with them toad-looking fishes, the Kanakis kind of balked, but finally they learnt something as put a new face on the matter. Seems that human folks has got a kind of relation to such water beasts, that everything alive come about of the water unked and only needs a little change to go back again. Them things told the Kanakis that if they mixed bloods, there'd be children as would look human at first, but later turn more and more like the things, till finally they take to the water and giant the main lot of things down there. And this is the important part, young fella. Them as turned into fish things and went into the water wouldn't never die. Them as was born more like the things changed early, but them as was nearly human sometimes stayed on the island till they was past seventy, though they'd usually go down under for trial trips afore that. Folks as had took to the water generally come back a good deal to visit, so as a man would often be a talking to his own five times great grandfather who'd left the dry land a couple of hundred years or so before. 
Everybody got out of the idea of dying. They thought what they got was well worth all they had to give up. And I guess Obed kind of come to think the same himself when he chewed over old Wallachia's story a bit. Wallachia, though, was one of the few as hadn't got none of the fish blood, being of a royal line that intermarry with royal lines on other islands. Wallachia, yeah, he showed Obed a lot of rites and incantations as had to do with the sea things, and let him see some of the folks in the villages had changed a lot from human shape. Somehow or other, though, he never would let him see one of the regular things from right out of the water. In the end, he give him a funny kind of thingamajig made out of lead or something that he said it'd bring up the fish things from any place in the water where there might be a nest of them. Matt, now he didn't like this business at all and wanted Obed should keep away from the island. But the captain was sharp for gain and found he could get them gold like things so cheap it'd pay him to make a speciality of them. Things went on that way for years, and Obed got enough of that gold-like stuff to make him start the refinery in Wade's old run-down fulling mill. He didn't dare sell the pieces like they was for folks would be all the time asking questions. All the same, his crews would get a piece and dispose of it now and then, even though they were swore to keep quiet, and he let his women folks wear some of the pieces as was more human-like than most. Well, come about 38, when I was seven year old, Obed, he found the island people all wiped out between voyages. Seems the other normal islanders had got wind of what was going on and had took matters into their own hands. Pious cusses, these was. They didn't leave nothing standing on either the main island or the little volcanic island, except what parts of the ruins was too big to knock down. In some places, they was little stones strewed about, like charms. Folks all wiped out. No trace of no gold-like things, and none of the nearby canakees would breathe a word about the matter. Wouldn't even admit there'd ever been any people on that island. Well, that naturally hit Obed pretty hard, seeing as his normal trade was doing very poor. It hit the whole of his mouth, too, because in seafaring days, what profited the master of a ship generally profited the crew proportionate. Most of the folks around the town took the hard times kind of sheep-like and resigned, but they was in bad shape because the fishing was petering out and the mills wasn't doing none too well. Now then's the time, Obed. He began a cursing at the folks for being dull sheep and praying to a Christian heaven that didn't help him none. He told him he'd know that folks as prayed to God to give something you really need and says if a good bunch of men would stand by him, he could maybe get a hold of certain powers as it'd bring plenty of fish and quite a bit of gold. Of course, them as sarved on the Sumatra Queen and seed the island knowed what he meant, and weren't none too anxious to get close to see things like they'd hear tell on, but them as didn't know what it was all about got kind of swayed by what Obed had to say and begun to ask him what he could do to set him on the way to the faith as he'd bring him results. Poor Matt. Matt, he always was again it. He tried to line up the folks on his side and had long talks with the preachers, not no use. They run the congregational parson out of town and the Methodist feller quit. Never did see resolved Babcock the Baptist parson again. Wrath of Jehovah, I was a mighty little critter, but I heard what I heard and seen what I seen. Dagon and Ashtoreth, Belial and Beelzebub, Golden Calf and the idols of Canaan and the Philistines, Babylonish abominations, meany, meany, tickle of parsing. He stopped, and from the look in his watery blue eyes, I feared he was close to a stupor brought on by the whiskey I'd given him. But when I gently shook his shoulder, 
He turned on me with astonishing alertness and snapped out some more obscure phrases. Don't believe me, huh? <laughs> yeah, you just tell me, young fella, why Captain Obad and 20 odd other folks used to row out to Devil Reef in the dead of night, a chant thing so loud you could hear him all over town when the wind was right. <laughs> tell me that, huh? And tell me why Obed was always dropping heavy things down into the deep water the other side of the reef where the bottom shoots down like a cliff lower and you can sound. Tell me what he done with that funny shaped leg thingamy jig as Wallachia gave him. And why'd the new church parsons, fellers as used to be sailors, wear them queer robes and cover themselves with them gold like things Obed brung, huh? The watery blue eyes were almost savage and maniacal now, and the dirty white beard bristled electrically. Old Zadok probably saw me shrink back, for he had begun to cackle evilly. <laughs> You're beginning to see, huh? The old man was getting hysterical, and I began to shiver with a nameless alarm. He laid a gnarled claw on my shoulder, and it seemed to me that it's shaking was not altogether that of mirth. You suppose one night you see something heavy heaved off an Obed's dory beyond the reef, and then learn next day a young feller was missing from home, huh? Did anybody ever see Hyde or Hera hear him Gilman again? Did they? And Nick Pierce? And Llewelly Waite? And Adoniram Southwick? And Henry Garrison, huh? <laughs> Shapes talk in sign language with their hands. Them has had real hands. Well, sir, that was the time Obed begun to get on his feet again. Folks see his three daughters are wearing gold-like things as nobody'd ever see on them before, and smoke started coming out of the refinery chimbley. Other folks were prospering, too. Fish begun to swarm into the harbor fit to kill. And heaven knows what size cargoes we'd begun to ship out to Newburyport, Arkham, and Boston. Twas then Obed got the old branch railroad put through. Some Kingsport fishermen heard about the catch and come up in sloops, but they was all lost. Nobody ever see them again. And just then, our folks organized the esoteric order of Dagon and bought Masonic Hall off in Cavalry Commandery for it. <laughs> Matt Elliot was a mason and again the selling, but he dropped out of sight just then. Now, remember, I ain't saying old Bear was sat on having things just like they was on that Kennecke Isle. I don't think he ain't the first to do no mixing, nor raise no young'uns to take to the water and turn into fishes with eternal life. He wanted them gold things and was willing to pay heavy, and I guess the others was satisfied for a while. Come in 46, the town done some looking and thinking for itself. There too many folks missing, too much wild preaching at meeting of a Sunday. Too much talk about that reef. There was a party one night as followed Obed's crowd out to the reef, and I heard shots betwixt the dories. Next day, Obed and 32 others was in jail, with everybody a wondering just what was afoot and just what charge again him could be got to hold. God, if anybody had look ahead. A couple weeks later, when nothing had been thrown into the sea for that long. He paused for a while, and when he finally continued, his voice was little more than a hoarse whisper. That awful night. I seed him. I was up in the cupola of our house. Hordes of them. Swarms of them. All over the reef. Swimming up the harbor into the Minuxet. God, what happened in the streets of Ben's mouth that night? They rattled our door. But Pa wouldn't open. And then he clumb out of the kitchen window with his musket to find select men Maori and see what he could do. Mounds of the dead and the dying. Shots and screams. Shouting in Old Square and Town Square. New Church Green. Jail throwed open. 
proclamation, treason, and called it the plague when folks come in and found half our people missing. Nobody left but them as a giant in with Obed and them things, or else keep quiet. Never heard of my pa no more. The old man was panting and perspiring profusely. Everything cleaned up in the morning, uh, but there was traces. Obed, he kind of takes charge and says things is going to be changed. Others will worship with us at meeting time. And certain houses has got to entertain guests. They wanted to mix like they done with the canakies. And he, for one, didn't feel bound to stop him. Far gone was Obed, just like a crazy man on the subject. He says they brung us fish and treasure and should have what they hankered after. Nothing was to be different on the outside. Only we was to keep shy of strangers if we knowed what was good for us. We all had to take the oath of Dagon, and later on they was second and third oaths that some on us took. They must have helped special and get special rewards, gold and such. No use balking, for they was millions of them down there. They'd rather not start rising and wiping out humankind, but if they was gave away and forced to... They could do a lot toward just that. Now, we didn't have them old charms to cut them off like folks in the South Sea did, and them canakies wouldn't never give away their secrets. Yield up enough sacrifices and savage knickknacks and harborage in the town when they wanted it, and they let well enough alone. Wouldn't bother no strangers as might bear tales outside, that is, without they got prying. All in the band of the faithful, order a Dagon, and the children should never die, but go back to the mother Hydra and father Dagon, where we all come from, Ankh. La, la, Cthulhu for taken, fun gluey, mgluwa nuf, Cthulhu relia, waga nagel for taken. Old Zadok was fast lapsing into stark raving, and I held my breath. Poor old soul. To what pitiful depths of hallucination had his liquor, plus his hatred of the decay, alienage, and disease around him brought that fertile, imaginative brain? He began to moan now, and tears were coursing down his channeled cheeks into the depths of his beard. God, what I seen sank thou with fifteen-year-old. Mean, mean, a tickle of parson. The folks as was missing, and them as killed themselves. Them as told things in Arkham or Ipswich or such places was all called crazy, like you're calling me right now. But God, what I seen. They'd have killed me long ago for what I know. Only I took the first and second oaths of Dagon off of no bin. So I was protected unless in a jury of unproved I told things knowing and deliberate. But I wouldn't take the third oath. I'd have died rather than take that. It got worse around Civil War time, when children born St. 46 begun to grow up. Some of them, that is. I was a fear. Never did no prying out of that awful night. and never see one of... Them, close to in all my life. That is never no full-blooded one. I went to the war, and if I'd have had any guts or sense, I'd have never come back, but settled away from here. But folks wrote me things once so bad. That, I suppose, was because government draft men was in town after 63. After the war, it was just as bad again people begun to fall off, mills and shops shut down, shipping stopped and the harbor choked up, railroad give up, but they, they never stopped swimming in and out of the river from that cursed reef of Satan, and more and more attic winders got aboard it up, and more and more noises was heard in houses as one supposed to have nobody in them. 
And then 46, Captain Obed took a second wife that nobody in the town never seen. Some says he didn't want to, but was made to by them as he called in. He had three children by her. Two was disappeared young, but one gal has looked like anybody else and was educated in Europe. Obed finally got her married off by a trick to an Arkham fella as didn't suspect nothing. But nobody outside will have nothing to do with Ann's mouth folks now. Barnabas Marsh that runs the refinery now is Obed's grandson by his first wife, son of Onesiphorus, his eldest son. But his mother was another of them as one never seen outdoors. Right now, Barnabas is about changed. Can't shed his eyes no more, and is all out of shape. Maybe he's tried it already. They do sometimes go down for little spells before they go for good. Ain't been seen about in public for now on ten years. Don't know how his poor wife can feel. She come from Ipswich, and they nigh lynched Barnabas when he courted her fifty-odd year ago. Obed, he died in 78, and all the next generation's gone now. His first wife's children, Dan, and the rest, God knows. The sound of the incoming tide was now very insistent, and little by little it seemed to change the old man's mood from maudlin tearfulness to watchful fear. He would pause now and then to renew those nervous glances over his shoulder or out toward the reef. And despite the wild absurdity of his tale, I could not help beginning to share his vague apprehensiveness. Zadok now grew shriller and seemed to be trying to whip up his courage with louder speech. Hey, you, why don't you say something? How would you like to be living in a town like this? With everything a rotten and a dying and boarded up monsters crawling and bleating and barking and hopping around black cellars and attics every way you turn. Hey! How'd you like to hear the howling night after night from the churches and order a dag and hall and know what's doing part of the howling? How'd you like to hear what comes from that awful reef every May Eve and owl mass? Huh? You think the old man's crazy, huh? Well, sir, let me tell you, that ain't the worst. Well, even if I ain't told nobody nothing yet, I'm a going to now. You just sit still and listen to me, boy. This is what I ain't never told nobody. I says I didn't do no prying after that night, but I found things out just the same. You want to know what the real horror is, huh? Well, this is it. Well, it's this. It ain't what them fish devils has done, but what they're a going to do. They're a bringing things up out of where they come from into the town. They've been doing it for years and slacking it up lately. Them, them houses north of the river betwixt water and main streets is full of them. Them devils and what they brung. And when they get ready, I say... When they get ready. You ever hear tell of a shoggoth? Hey, do you hear me? I tell you, I know what them things be. I seen them one night when... Uh, uh, oh, <coughs> the hideous suddenness and inhuman frightfulness of the old man's shriek almost made me faint. His eyes... Looking past me toward the malodorous sea were positively starting from his head, while his face was a mask of fear worthy of Greek tragedy. His bony claw dug monstrously into my shoulder, and he made no motion as I turned my head to look at whatever he glimpsed. There was nothing that I could see, only the incoming tide, with perhaps one set of ripples more local than the long-flung line of breakers. But now, Zadok was shaking me and I turned back to watch the melting of that fear-frozen face into a chaos of twitching eyelids and mumbling gums. Presently his voice came back, albeit as a trembling whisper. You can get out of here! Get out of here! 
They seen us. Get out for your life. Don't wait for nothing. They know now. Run for it. Quick. Out of this town. Another heavy wave dashed against the loosening masonry of the bygone wharf and changed the mad ancient's whisper to another inhuman and blood-curdling scream. <laughs> Before I could recover my scattered wits, he had relaxed his clutch on my shoulder and dashed wildly inland toward the street, reeling northward around the ruined warehouse wall. I glanced back at the sea, but there was nothing there. And when I reached Water Street and looked along it toward the north, there was no remaining trace of Zadok Allen. I boarded the empty coach and took the same seat I had taken before, but was hardly settled before its driver reappeared and began mumbling in a throaty voice of peculiar repulsiveness. I was, it appeared, in very bad luck. There had been something wrong with the engine, despite the excellent time made from Newburyport, and the bus could not complete the journey to Arkham. Sergeant was sorry, but I would have to stop over at the Gilman Hotel. Probably the clerk would make the price easy for me, but there was nothing else to do. Almost dazed by this sudden obstacle and violently dreading the fall of night in this decaying and half-unlighted town, I left the bus and re-entered the hotel lobby, where the sullen, queer-looking night clerk told me I could have room 4 to 8 on next the top floor, large but without running water, for a dollar. I was immediately disturbed to find the absence of a bolt on the door of my room. One had been there, as marks clearly showed, but there were signs of recent removal. No doubt it had become out of order, like so many other things in this decrepit edifice. In my nervousness, I looked around and discovered a bolt on the clothes press which seemed to be of the same size, judging from the marks, as the one formerly on the door. To gain a partial relief from the general tension, I busied myself by transferring this hardware to the vacant place with the aid of a handy three-in-one device, including a screwdriver, which I kept on my keyring. The bolt fitted perfectly, and I was somewhat relieved when I knew that I could shoot it firmly upon retiring. There were adequate bolts on the two lateral doors to connecting rooms, and these I proceeded to fasten. I did not undress, but decided to read till I was sleepy and then lie down with only my coat, collar and shoes off. Taking a pocket flashlight from my valise, I placed it in my trousers so that I could read my watch if I woke up later in the dark. At length, feeling a fatigue which had nothing of drowsiness in it, I bolted the newly outfitted hall door, turned off the light and threw myself down on the hard, uneven bed. Coat collar, shoes, and all. Then, after a long, dreary interval, and prefaced by a creaking of stairs and corridor, there came that soft, damnably unmistakable sound which seemed like a malign fulfillment of all my apprehensions. Without the least shadow of a doubt, the lock on my hall door was being tried, cautiously, furtively, tentatively. It never once occurred to me that the fumbling might be a mere mistake. Malign purpose was all I could think of, and I kept deathly quiet, awaiting the would-be intruder's next move. After a time, the cautious rattling ceased and I heard the room to the north entered with a passkey. Then the lock of the connecting door to my room was softly tried. The bolt held, of course, and I heard the floor creak as the prowler left the room. After a moment, there came another soft rattling, and I knew that the room to the south of me was being entered. Again, 
a furtive trying of a bolted connecting door, and again, a receding creaking. This time the creaking went along the hall and down the stairs, so I knew that the prowler had realized the bolted condition of my doors and was giving up his attempt for a greater or lesser time, as the future would show. The readiness with which I fell into a plan of action proves that I must have been subconsciously fearing some menace and considering possible avenues of escape for hours. From the first, I felt that the unseen fumbler meant a danger not to be met or dealt with, but only to be fled from as precipitately as possible. The one thing to do was to get out of that hotel alive as quickly as I could and through some channel other than the front stairs and lobby. Rising softly and throwing my flashlight on the switch, I sought to light the bulb over my bed in order to choose and pocket some belongings for a swift, valiseless flight. Nothing, however, happened, and I saw that the power had been cut off. Clearly some cryptic, evil movement was afoot on a large scale, just what I could not say. As I stood pondering with my hand on the now useless switch, I heard a muffled creaking on the floor below, and thought I could barely distinguish voices in conversation. A moment later I felt less sure that the deeper sounds were voices, since the apparent hoarse barkings and loose syllabled croakings bore so little resemblance to recognized human speech. Then I thought with renewed force of what the factory inspector had heard in the night in this moldering and pestilential building. Having filled my pockets with the flashlight's aid, I put on my hat and tiptoed to the windows to consider chances of descent. Despite the state's safety regulations, there was no fire escape on this side of the hotel, and I saw that my windows commanded only a sheer three-story drop to the cobbled courtyard. On the right and left, however, some ancient brick business blocks abutted on the hotel, their slant roofs coming up to a reasonable jumping distance from my fourth-story level. To reach either of these lines of buildings, I would have to be in a room two doors from my own, in one case on the north and in the other case on the south, and my mind instantly set to work calculating what chances I had of making the transfer. I could not, I decided, risk an emergence into the corridor where my footsteps would surely be heard and where the difficulties of entering the desired room would be insuperable. My progress, if it was to be made at all, would have to be through the less solidly built connecting doors of the rooms, the locks and bolts of which I would have to force violently, using my shoulder as a battering ram whenever they were set against me. This, I thought, would be possible owing to the rickety nature of the house and its fixtures. But I realized I could not do it noiselessly. I would have to count on sheer speed and the chance of getting to a window before any hostile forces became coordinated enough to open the right door toward me with a passkey. My own outer door I reinforced by pushing the bureau against it little by little in order to make a minimum of sound. I perceived that my chances were very slender and was fully prepared for any calamity. Even getting to another roof would not solve the problem, for there would then remain the task of reaching the ground and escaping from the town. One thing in my favor was the deserted and ruinous state of the abutting buildings, and the number of skylights gaping blackly open in each row. Gathering from the grocery boy's map that the best route out of town was southward, I glanced first at the connecting door on the south side of the room. It was designed to open in my direction, hence I saw it was not a favorable one for forcing. Accordingly, abandoning it as a route, I cautiously moved the bedstead against it to hamper any attack which might be made on it later from the next room. The door on the north was hung to open away from me, and this, though a test proved it to be locked or bolted from the other side, I knew must be my route. If I could gain the roofs of the buildings in Payne Street and descend successfully to the ground level, I might perhaps dart through the courtyard and the adjacent or opposite buildings to Washington or Bates, or else emerge in Payne and edge around southward into Washington, 
In any case, I would aim to strike Washington somehow and get quickly out of the town square region. My preference would be to avoid pain, since the fire station there might be open all night. As I thought of these things, I looked out over the squalid sea of decaying roofs below me, now brightened by the beams of a moon not much past full. On the right, the black gash of the river gorge clove the panorama, abandoned factories and railway station clinging barnacle-like to its sides. Beyond it, the rusted railway and the Rowley Road led off through a flat, marshy terrain dotted with islets of higher and drier scrub-grown land. On the left, the creek-threaded countryside was nearer, the narrow road to Ipswich gleaming white in the moonlight. I could not see from my side of the hotel the southward route toward Arkham, which I had determined to take. I was irresolutely speculating on when I had better attack the northward door and on how I could least audibly manage it, when I noticed that the vague noises underfoot had given place to a fresh and heavier creaking of the stairs. A wavering flicker of light showed through my transom and the boards of the corridor began to groan with a ponderous load. Muffled sounds of possible vocal origin approached, and at length, a firm knock came at my outer door. For a moment, I simply held my breath and waited. Eternity seemed to elapse, and the nauseous, fishy odor of my environment seemed to mount suddenly and spectacularly. Then the knocking was repeated, continuously and with growing insistence. I knew that the time for action had come, and forthwith drew the bolt of the northward connecting door, bracing myself for the task of battering it open. The knocking waxed louder, and I hoped that its volume would cover the sound of my efforts. At last, beginning my attempt, I lunged again and again at the thin panelling with my left shoulder, heedless of shock or pain. The door resisted even more than I had expected, but I did not give in, and all the while the clamour at the outer door increased. Finally the connecting door gave, but with such a crash that I knew those outside must have heard. Instantly, the outside knocking became a violent battering, while keys sounded ominously in the hall doors of the rooms on both sides of me. Rushing through the newly opened connection, I succeeded in bolting the northerly hall door before the lock could be turned. But even as I did so, I heard the hall door of the third room, the one from whose window I had hoped to reach the roof below, being tried with a pass key. For an instant, I felt absolute despair, since my trapping in a chamber with no window egress seemed complete. A wave of almost abnormal horror swept over me and invested with a terrible but unexplainable singularity the flashlight glimpsed dust prints made by the intruder who had lately tried my door from this room. Then with a dazed automatism which persisted despite hopelessness, I made for the next connecting door and performed the blind motion of pushing at it in an effort to get through, and, granting that fastenings might be as providentially intact as in this second room, bolt the hall door beyond before the lock could be turned from outside. Sheer, fortunate chance gave me my reprieve, for the connecting door before me was not only unlocked, but actually ajar. In a second I was through and had my right knee and shoulder against a hall door which was visibly opening inward. My pressure took the opener off guard, for the thing shut as I pushed, so that I could slip the well-conditioned bolt as I had done with the other door. As I gained this respite, I heard the battering at the two other doors abate, while a confused clatter came from the connecting door I had shielded with the bedstead. Evidently, the bulk of my assailants had entered the southerly room and were massing in a lateral attack. But at the same moment, a pass key sounded in the next door to the north, and I knew that a nearer peril was at hand. The northward connecting door was wide open, but there was no time to think about checking the already turning lock in the hall. 
All I could do was to shut and bolt the open connecting door, as well as its mate on the opposite side, pushing a bedstead against the one and a bureau against the other, and moving a washstand in front of the hall door. I must, I saw, trust to such makeshift barriers to shield me till I could get out the window and on the roof of the Payne Street block. But even in this acute moment, my chief horror was something apart from the immediate weakness of my defences. I was shuddering because not one of my pursuers, despite some hideous pantings, gruntings and subdued barkings at odd intervals, was uttering an unmuffled or intelligible vocal sound. As I moved the furniture and rushed toward the windows, I heard a frightful scurrying along the corridor toward the room north of me and perceived that the southward battering had ceased. Plainly, most of my opponents were about to concentrate against the feeble connecting door which they knew must open directly on me. Outside, the moon played on the ridge pole of the block below, and I saw that the jump would be desperately hazardous because of the steep surface on which I must land. Surveying the conditions, I chose the more southerly of the two windows as my avenue of escape, planning to land on the inner slope of the roof and make for the nearest skylight. Once inside one of the decrepit brick structures, I would have to reckon with pursuit, but I hoped to descend and dodge in and out of yawning doorways along the shadowed courtyard, eventually getting to Washington Street and slipping out of town toward the south. The clatter at the northerly connecting door was now terrific, and I saw that the weak panelling was beginning to splinter. Obviously, the besiegers had brought some ponderous object into play as a battering ram. The bedstead, however, still held firm, so that I had at least a faint chance of making good my escape. As I opened the window, I noticed that it was flanked by heavy velour draperies suspended from a pole by brass rings, and also that there was a large projecting catch for the shutters on the exterior. Seeing a possible means of avoiding the dangerous jump, I yanked at the hangings and brought them down, pole and all, then quickly hooking two of the rings in the shutter catch and flinging the drapery outside. The heavy folds reached fully to the abutting roof, and I saw that the rings and catch would be likely to bear my weight. So, climbing out of the window and down the improvised rope ladder, I left behind me forever the morbid, and horror-infested fabric of the Gilman House. I landed safely on the loose slates of the steep roof and succeeded in gaining the gaping black skylight without a slip. Glancing up at the window I had left, I observed it was still dark, though far across the crumbling chimneys to the north, I could see lights ominously blazing in the order of Dagon Hall, the Baptist Church, and the Congregational Church, which I recalled so shiveringly. There had seemed to be no one in the courtyard below, and I hoped there would be a chance to get away before the spreading of a general alarm. Flashing my pocket lamp into the skylight, I saw there were no steps down. The distance was slight, however, so I clambered over the brink and dropped striking a dusty floor littered with crumbling boxes and barrels. The place was ghoulish looking, but I was past minding such impressions and made at once for the staircase revealed by my flashlight after a hasty glance at my watch which showed the hour to be 2 a.m. The steps creaked but seemed tolerably sound and I raced down past a barn-like second story to the ground floor. The desolation was complete and only echoes answered my footfalls. At length I reached the lower hall, at one end of which I saw a faint, luminous rectangle marking the ruined Payne Street doorway. Heading the other way, I found the back door also open, and darted out and down five stone steps to the grass-grown cobblestones of the courtyard. The moonbeams did not reach down here, but I could just see my way about without using the flashlight. Some of the windows on the Gilman House side were faintly glowing, and I thought I heard confused sounds within. Walking softly over to the Washington Street side, I perceived several open doorways and chose the nearest as my route out. The hallway inside was black, and when I reached the opposite end, 
I saw that the street door was wedged immovably shut. Resolved to try another building, I groped my way back toward the courtyard, but stopped short when close to the doorway. For out of an open door in the Gilman house, a large crowd of doubtful shapes was pouring, lanterns bobbing in the darkness and horrible croaking voices exchanging low cries in what was certainly not English. The figures moved uncertainly, and I realized to my relief that they did not know where I had gone. But for all that, they sent a shiver of horror through my frame. Their features were indistinguishable, but their crouching, shambling gait was abominably repellent. And worst of all, I perceived that one figure was strangely robed and unmistakably surmounted by a tall tiara of a design altogether too familiar. As the figures spread throughout the courtyard, I felt my fears increase. Suppose I could find no egress from this building on the street side. The fishy odor was detestable, and I wondered I could stand it without fainting. Again groping toward the street, I opened a door off the hall and came upon an empty room with closely shuttered but sashless windows. Fumbling in the rays of my flashlight, I found I could open the shutters, and in another moment had climbed outside and was carefully closing the aperture in its original manner. I was now in Washington Street, and for the moment saw no living thing, nor any light, save that of the moon. From several directions in the distance, however, I could hear the sound of hoarse voices, of footsteps, and of a curious kind of pattering, which did not sound quite like footsteps. Plainly, I had no time to lose. The points of the compass were clear to me, and I was glad that all the streetlights were turned off, as is often the custom on strongly moonlit nights in unprosperous rural regions. Some of the sounds came from the south, yet I retained my design of escaping in that direction. There would, I knew, be plenty of deserted doorways to shelter me in case I met any person or group who looked like pursuers. I walked rapidly, softly, and close to the ruined houses. While hatless and disheveled after my arduous climb, I did not look especially noticeable, and stood a good chance of passing unheeded if forced to encounter any casual wayfarer. At Bates Street, I drew into a yawning vestibule while two shambling figures crossed in front of me, but was soon on my way again and approaching the open space where Elliott Street obliquely crosses Washington at the intersection of South. Though I had never seen this space, it had looked dangerous to me on the grocery youth's map, since the moonlight would have free play there. There was no use trying to evade it, for any alternative course would involve detours of possibly disastrous visibility and delaying effect. The only thing to do was to cross it boldly and openly, imitating the typical shamble of the Innsmouth folk as best I could, and trusting that no one or at least no pursuer of mine, would be there. Just how fully the pursuit was organized, and indeed just what its purpose might be, I could form no idea. There seemed to be unusual activity in the town, but I judged that the news of my escape from the Gilman had not yet spread. I would, of course, soon have to shift from Washington to some other southward street for that party from the hotel would doubtless be after me. I must have left dust prints in that last old building, revealing how I'd gained the street. The open space was, as I had expected, strongly moonlit, and I saw the remains of a park-like, iron-railed green in its center. Fortunately, no one was about, though a curious sort of buzz or roar seemed to be increasing in the direction of Town Square. South Street was very wide, leading directly down a slight declivity to the waterfront and commanding a long view out at sea, and I hoped that no one would be glancing up it from afar as I crossed in the bright moonlight. My progress was unimpeded, and no fresh sound arose to hint that I had been spied. 
glancing about me. I involuntarily let my pace slacken for a second to take in the sight of the sea, gorgeous in the burning moonlight at the street's end. Far out beyond the breakwater was the dim, dark line of Devil Reef, and as I glimpsed it, I could not help thinking of all the hideous legends I had heard in the last 34 hours. Legends which portrayed this ragged rock as a veritable gateway to realms of unfathomed horror and inconceivable abnormality. Then, without warning, I saw the intermittent flashes of light on the distant reef. They were definite and unmistakable, and awaked in my mind a blind horror beyond all rational proportion. My muscles tightened for panic flight, held in only by a certain unconscious caution and half-hypnotic fascination. And to make matters worse, there now flashed forth from the lofty cupola of the Gilman House, which loomed up to the northeast behind me, a series of analogous, though differently spaced gleams which could be nothing less than an answering signal. Controlling my muscles and realizing afresh how plainly visible I was, I resumed my brisker and feignedly shambling pace, though keeping my eyes on that hellish and ominous reef as long as the opening of South Street gave me a seaward view. What the whole proceeding meant I could not imagine, unless it involved some strange rite connected with Devil Reef, or unless some party had landed from a ship on that sinister rock. I now bent to the left around the ruinous green, still gazing toward the ocean as it blazed in the spectral summer moonlight, and watching the cryptical flashing of those nameless, unexplainable beacons. It was then that the most horrible impression of all was borne in upon me. The impression which destroyed my last vestige of self-control and set me running frantically southward past the yawning black doorways and fishily staring windows of that deserted nightmare street. For at a closer glance, I saw that the moonlit waters between the reef and the shore were far from empty. They were alive, with a teeming horde of shapes swimming inward toward the town. And even at my vast distance, and in my single moment of perception, I could tell that the bobbing heads and flailing arms were alien and aberrant in a way scarcely to be expressed or consciously formulated. My frantic running ceased before I had covered a block, for at my left I began to hear something like the hue and cry of organized pursuit. There were footsteps and guttural sounds, and a rattling motor wheezed south along Federal Street. In a second all my plans were utterly changed, for if the southward highway were blocked ahead of me, I must clearly find another egress from Innsmouth. I paused and drew into a gaping doorway, reflecting how lucky I was to have left the moonlit open space before these pursuers came down the parallel street. I decided to leave using the abandoned railway track. Then, as my gaze circled inland from the town, something less tranquil arrested my notice and held me immobile for a second. What I saw, or fancied I saw, was a disturbing suggestion of undulant motion far to the south. A suggestion which made me conclude that a very large horde must be pouring out of the city along the level Ipswich Road. The distance was great, and I could distinguish nothing in detail, but I did not at all like the look of that moving column. It undulated too much and glistened too brightly in the rays of the now westering moon. There was a suggestion of sound, too, though the wind was blowing the other way, a suggestion of bestial scraping and bellowing, even worse than the muttering of the parties I had lately overheard. All sorts of unpleasant conjectures crossed my mind. I thought of those very extreme Innsmouth types said to be hidden in crumbling, centuried warrens near the waterfront. I thought, too, of those nameless swimmers I had seen, Counting the parties so far glimpsed, 
as well as those presumably covering other roads, the number of my pursuers must be strangely large for a town as depopulated as Innsmouth. I had entered the brush-grown cut and was struggling along at a very slow pace when that damnable, fishy odour again waxed dominant. Had the wind suddenly changed eastward so that it blew in from the sea and over the town? It must have, I concluded, since I now began to hear shocking, guttural murmurs from that hitherto silent direction. There was another sound, too. A kind of wholesale, colossal flopping or pattering, which somehow called up images of the most detestable sort. It made me think illogically of that unpleasantly undulating column on the far-off Ipswich Road. And then, both stench and sounds grew stronger, so that I paused, shivering and grateful for the cut's protection. Crouched in the bushes of that sandy cleft, I felt reasonably safe, even though I knew the searchers would have to cross the track in front of me, not much more than a hundred yards away. I would be able to see them, but they could not, except by a malign miracle, see me. All at once I began dreading to look at them as they passed. I saw the close moonlit space where they would surge by, and had curious thoughts about the irredeemable pollution of that space. They would perhaps be the worst of all in mouth types, something one would not care to remember. The stench waxed overpowering, and the noises swelled to a bestial babble of croaking, baying, and barking without the least suggestion of human speech. Were these indeed the voices of my pursuers? Did they have dogs after all? So far I had seen none of the lower animals in Innsmouth. That flopping or pattering was monstrous. I could not look upon the degenerate creatures responsible for it. I would keep my eyes shut till the sounds receded toward the west. I am not even yet willing to say whether what followed was a hideous actuality or only a nightmare hallucination. The later action of the government, after my frantic appeals, would tend to confirm it as a monstrous truth. But could not a hallucination have been repeated under the quasi-hypnotic spell of that ancient, haunted and shadowed town? Such places have strange properties, and the legacy of insane legend might well have acted on more than one human imagination amidst those dead, stench-cursed streets and huddles of rotting roofs and crumbling steeples. Is it not possible that the germ of an actual, contagious madness lurks in the depths of that shadow over Innsmouth? Who can be sure of reality after hearing things like the tale of old Zadok Allen? The government men never found poor Zadok, and have no conjectures to make as to what became of him. Where does madness leave off and reality begin? Is it possible that even my latest fear is sheer delusion? But I must try to tell what I thought I saw that night under the mocking yellow moon. Saw surging and hopping down the Rowley Road in plain sight in front of me as I crouched among the wild brambles of that desolate railway cot. Then I knew that a long section of them must be plainly in sight where the sides of the cut flattened out and the road crossed the track. And I could no longer keep myself from sampling whatever horror that leering yellow moon might have to show. It was the end. For whatever remains to me of life on the surface of this earth, of every vestige of mental peace and confidence in the integrity of nature and of the human mind, can it be possible that this planet has actually spawned such things? That human eyes have truly seen as objective flesh what man has hitherto known only in febrile fantasy, a tenuous legend? And yet I saw them in a limitless stream, flopping, hopping, croaking, bleating, surging inhumanly through the spectral moonlight in a grotesque, malignant saraband of fantastic nightmare. 
and some of them had tall tiaras of that nameless whitish gold metal, and some were strangely robed, and one who led the way was clad in a ghoulishly humped black coat and striped trousers, and had a man's felt hat perched on the shapeless thing that answered for a head. I think their predominant color was a grayish green, though they had white bellies. They were mostly shiny and slippery, but the ridges of their backs were scaly. Their forms vaguely suggested the anthropoid, while their heads were the heads of fish, with prodigious bulging eyes that never closed. At the sides of their necks were palpitating gills, and their long paws were webbed. They hopped irregularly, sometimes on two legs, sometimes on four. I was somehow glad that they had no more than four limbs. Their croaking, baying voices clearly used for articulate speech held all the dark shades of expression which their staring faces lacked. But for all their monstrousness, they were not unfamiliar to me. I knew too well what they must be, for was not the memory of that evil tiara at Newburyport still fresh? They were the blasphemous fish frogs of the nameless design, living, horrible, and their number was past guessing. It seemed to me that there were limitless swarms of them, and certainly my momentary glimpse could have shown only the least fraction. In another instant, everything was blotted out by a merciful fit of fainting, the first I had ever had. It was a gentle daylight rain that awaked me from my stupor in the brush-grown railway cart. And when I staggered out to the roadway ahead, I saw no trace of any prints in the fresh mud. The fishy odor, too, was gone. Inn's mouth, ruined roofs and toppling steeples loomed up greyly toward the southeast. But not a living creature did I spy in all the desolate salt marshes around. My watch was still going, and told me that the hour was past noon. Despite weakness, hunger, horror, and bewilderment, I found myself after a long time able to walk, so started slowly along the muddy road to Rowley. Before evening, I was in the village, getting a meal and providing myself with presentable clothes. I caught the night train to Arkham, and the next day talked long and earnestly with government officials there, a process I later repeated in Boston. With the main result of these colloquies, the public is now familiar, and I wish for normality's sake there were nothing more to tell. Perhaps it is madness that is overtaking me, yet perhaps a greater horror or a greater marvel is reaching out. As may well be imagined, I gave up most of the foreplanned features of the rest of my tour, the scenic, architectural and antiquarian diversions on which I had counted so heavily. Nor did I dare look for that piece of strange jewellery said to be in the Miskatonic University Museum. I did, however, improve my stay in Arkham by collecting some genealogical notes I had long wished to possess. Very rough and hasty data, it's true but capable of good use later on, when I might have time to collate and codify them. The curator of the historical society there, Mr. E. Lapham Peabody, was very courteous about assisting me, and expressed unusual interest when I told him I was a grandson of Eliza Orne of Arkham, who was born in 1867 and had married James Williamson of Ohio at the age of 17. It seemed that a maternal uncle of mine had been there many years before on a quest much like my own, and that my grandmother's family was a topic of some local curiosity. There had, Mr. Peabody said, been considerable discussion about the marriage of her father, Benjamin Orne, just after the Civil War, since the ancestry of the bride was peculiarly puzzling. That bride 
was understood to have been an orphaned Marsh of New Hampshire, a cousin of the Essex County Marshes. But her education had been in France, and she knew very little of her family. A guardian had deposited funds in a Boston bank to maintain her and her French governess. But that guardian's name was unfamiliar to Arkham people, and in time he dropped out of sight, so that the governess assumed his role by court appointment. But the most baffling thing was the inability of anyone to place the recorded parents of the young woman, Enoch and Lydia Meserve Marsh, among the known families of New Hampshire. Possibly, many suggested, she was the natural daughter of some Marsh of prominence. She certainly had the true Marsh eyes. Most of the puzzling was done after her early death, which took place at the birth of my grandmother, her only child. Having formed some disagreeable impressions connected with the name of Marsh, I did not welcome the news that it belonged on my own ancestral tree. Nor was I pleased by Mr. Peabody's suggestion that I had the true Marsh eyes myself. However, I was grateful for data which I knew would prove valuable, and took copious notes and lists of book references regarding the well-documented Orn family. I went directly home and spent a month recuperating from my ordeal. In September, I entered Oberlin for my final year, and from then till the next June, was busy with studies and other wholesome activities, reminded of the bygone terror only by occasional official visits from government men in connection with the campaign which my pleas and evidence had started. Around the middle of July, just a year after the Innsmouth experience, I spent a week with my late mother's family, checking some of my new genealogical data with the various notes, traditions and bits of heirloom material in existence there, and seeing what kind of connected chart I could construct. My Arkham-born grandmother had seemed strange and almost terrifying to me, and I do not think I grieved when she disappeared. I was eight years old then and it was said that she had wandered off in grief after the suicide of my uncle Douglas, her eldest son. He had shot himself after a trip to New England, the same trip, no doubt, which had caused him to be recalled at the Arkham Historical Society. This uncle had resembled her, and I had never liked him either. Something about the staring, unwinking expression of both of them had given me a vague, unaccountable uneasiness. My mother and Uncle Walter had not looked like that. They were like their father, though poor little cousin Lawrence, Walter's son, had been an almost perfect duplicate of his grandmother before his condition took him to the permanent seclusion of a sanitarium at Canton. I had not seen him in four years, but my uncle once implied that his state, both mental and physical, was very bad. This worry had probably been a major cause of his mother's death two years before. My grandfather and his widowed son, Walter, now comprised the family household. But the memory of older times hung thickly over it. I still disliked the place and tried to get my researches done as quickly as possible. Williamson records and traditions were supplied in abundance by my grandfather. Though for Orn material, I had to depend on my uncle, Walter, who put at my disposal the contents of all his files including notes, letters, cuttings, heirlooms, photographs, and miniatures. It was in going over the letters and pictures on the Orn side that I began to acquire a kind of terror of my own ancestry. As I have said, my grandmother and Uncle Douglas had always disturbed me. Now, years after their passing, I gazed at their pictured faces with a measurably heightened feeling of repulsion and alienation. I could not at first understand the change, but gradually a horrible sort of comparison began to obtrude itself on my unconscious mind, despite the steady refusal of my consciousness to admit even the least suspicion of it. It was clear that the typical expression of these faces now suggested something it had not suggested before, something which would bring stark panic if too openly thought of. 
But the worst shock came when my uncle showed me the Orn jewelry in a downtown safe deposit vault. Some of the items were delicate and inspiring enough, but there was one box of strange old pieces descended from my mysterious great-grandmother, which my uncle was almost reluctant to produce. They were, he said, of very grotesque and almost repulsive design, and had never, to his knowledge, been publicly worn, though my grandmother used to enjoy looking at them. Vague legends of bad luck clustered around them, and my great-grandmother's French governess had said they ought not to be worn in New England, though it would be quite safe to wear them in Europe. As my uncle began slowly and grudgingly to unwrap the things, he urged me not to be shocked by the strangeness and frequent hideousness of the designs. Artists and archaeologists who had seen them pronounced the workmanship superlatively and exotically exquisite though no one seemed able to define their exact material or assign them to any specific art tradition. There were two armlets, a tiara, and a kind of pectoral, the latter having in high relief certain figures of almost unbearable extravagance. During this description, I had kept a tight rein on my emotions, but my face must have betrayed my mounting fears. My uncle looked concerned and paused in his unwrapping to study my countenance. I motioned to him to continue, which he did with renewed signs of reluctance. He seemed to expect some demonstration when the first piece, the tiara, became visible, but I doubt if he expected quite what actually happened. I did not expect it either, for I thought I was thoroughly forewarned regarding what the jewellery would turn out to be. What I did was to faint silently away, just as I had done in that briar-choked railway cut a year before. From that day on, my life has been a nightmare of brooding and apprehension. Nor do I know how much is hideous truth and how much madness. My great-grandmother had been a marsh of unknown source whose husband lived in Arkham, and did not old Zadok say that the daughter of Obed Marsh by a monstrous mother was married to an Arkham man through a trick. In Arkham too, the curator had told me I had the true Marsh eyes. Was Obed Marsh my own great-great-grandfather? Who or what then was my great-great-grandmother? But perhaps this was all madness those whitish gold ornaments might easily have been bought from some Innsmouth sailor by the father of my great-grandmother, whoever he was. And that look in the staring-eyed faces of my grandmother and self-slain uncle might be sheer fancy on my part. Sheer fancy, bolstered up by the Innsmouth shadow which had so darkly colored my imagination. But why had my uncle killed himself after an ancestral quest in New England? For more than two years, I fought off these reflections with partial success. My father secured me a place in an insurance office, and I buried myself in routine as deeply as possible. In the winter of 1930-31, however, the dreams began. They were very sparse and insidious at first, but increased in frequency and vividness as the weeks went by. Great watery spaces opened out before me, and I seemed to wander through titanic sunken porticos and labyrinths of weedy cyclopean walls with grotesque fissures as my companions. Then the other shapes began to appear, filling me with nameless horror the moment I awoke. But during the dreams, they did not horrify me at all. I was one with them, wearing their unhuman trappings treading their aqueous ways and praying monstrously at their evil sea-bottom temples. There was much more than I could remember, but even what I did remember each morning would be enough to stamp me as a madman or a genius if ever I dared write it down. 
Some frightful influence, I felt, was seeking gradually to drag me out of the sane world of wholesome life into unnameable abysses of blackness and alienage, and the process told heavily on me. My health and appearance grew steadily worse, till finally I was forced to give up my position and adopt the static, secluded life of an invalid. Some odd, nervous affliction had me in its grip, and I found myself at times almost unable to shut my eyes. It was then that I began to study the mirror with mounting alarm. The slow ravages of disease are not pleasant to watch, but in my case there was something subtler and more puzzling in the background. My father seemed to notice it too, for he began looking at me curiously and almost affrightedly. What was taking place in me? Could it be that I was coming to resemble my grandmother and Uncle Douglas? One night, I had a frightful dream in which I met my grandmother under the sea. She lived in a phosphorescent palace of many terraces with gardens of strange leprous corals and grotesque brachiate efflorescences and welcomed me with a warmth that may have been sardonic. She had changed as those who take to the water change and told me she had never died. Instead, she had gone to a spot her dead son had learned about and had leapt to a realm whose wonders, destined for him as well, he had spurned with a smoking pistol. This was to be my realm, too. I could not escape it. I would never die, but would live with those who had lived since before man ever walked the earth. I met also that which had been her grandmother. For 80,000 years, Pathila Lei had lived in Yahanithle, and thither she had gone back after Obed Marsh was dead. Yahanithle was not destroyed when the Upper Earth Men shot death into the sea. It was hurt, but not destroyed. The Deep Ones could never be destroyed, even though the Paleogean magic of the Forgotten Old Ones might sometimes check them. For the present, they would rest. But someday, if they remembered, they would rise again for the tribute Great Cthulhu craved. It would be a city greater than Innsmouth next time. They had planned to spread and had brought up that which would help them. But now they must wait once more. This was the dream in which I saw a Shoggoth creature for the first time, and the sight set me awake in a frenzy of screaming. That morning the mirror definitely told me I had acquired the Innsmouth look. So far I have not shot myself as my Uncle Douglas did. I bought an automatic and almost took the step. But certain dreams deterred me. The tense extremes of horror are lessening. And I feel queerly drawn toward the unknown sea deeps instead of fearing them. I hear and do strange things in sleep and awake with a kind of exaltation instead of terror. I do not believe I need to wait for the full change, as most have waited. If I did, my father would probably shut me up in a sanitarium as my poor little cousin is shut up. Stupendous and unheard of splendors await me below, and I shall seek them soon. La Raliya, Cthulhu Fatagan, La. La. No, I shall not shoot myself. I cannot be made to shoot myself. I shall plan my cousin's escape from that Canton madhouse. And together we shall go to marvel-shadowed Innsmouth. We shall swim out to that brooding reef in the sea and dive down through black abysses to Cyclopean and many-columned Yahanithle. And in that lair of the Deep Ones, we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever.
The Shadow Over In's Mouth was written by H.P. Lovecraft and read by Richard Coyle. It was abridged by Paul Kent and the music was composed by John Nichols. The series was produced by Neil Gardner and was a Ladbrook Radio production for BBC Radio 4 Extra.